All right, we're back after a brief hiatus. I'm here with episode nine of Wavy Physics. Obviously, it's been winter time. There's been no track days and race events going on, and I've just been buried in um, internal projects, so not much time to be making videos. But or well, recently, I've finished an aerodynamic study that involved a rear wing on a race car. So I was discussing this one with a client, and the question was presented: What makes a good rear wing? The questions that immediately pop into mind as an engineer are okay well, what defines best are you looking for the most downforce or are you looking for the most efficiency the least drag like what are the main considerations and then it made me think having an understanding of aerodynamics i've got an idea as to what some of the characteristics that are good in terms of rear wing performance but i didn't have any quantitative data in other words i didn't have any numbers it was all subjective and kind of based on my judgment. So that kicked off a study that I've completed and since written up in an article which is available on my website and on LinkedIn. And that basically takes the reader through the design process. Further to the written article, I thought it would also be good to generate a video. Let me take you through the, the process of design which is basically iterative. So I'd start with one design, make an improvement to it, make an improvement to it until eventually we get to something that we call an ideal wing profile. So it's probably important to give a bit of background for the non-motorsport or automotive enthusiasts on the concept of downforce. The wings you see on race cars and certain high performance cars are exactly the same as the wings you see on airplanes, they're just turned upside down. So as the car moves through the air, the wing serves to push the car down into the floor. The advantage to that is that you increase the vertical load on the tyres. As you increase vertical load on the tyres, you increase the coefficient of friction. You get more grip, which is beneficial to fast lap times. The downside of having a wing present, or pretty much any aerodynamic device, is that it generates drag. So in the context of a wing, pressure drag manifests itself simply by having a higher pressure by the leading edge and a lower pressure at the trailing edge of the wing. As air moves from a high to a low pressure, that creates pressure drag. On the other hand, viscous drag and the viscous effects of having an object moving through the air due to the internal frictions. As you're working the air, you incur a viscous drag penalty. So relating that all back to the study and the purpose of this video, you want to increase the vertical load on the tyres, but you also want to minimise the drag. And there are certain design characteristics that will be best suited to that and some that will be less suited to that. I designed a wing profile of uh, one meter span, so it's actually quite a short wing. The cord is 20 centimeters, 200 millimeters. So it's quite a short wing, but that's going to be enough for us to understand like wing behavior and can be easily scaled for another application. First thing first, I've got to create the, the CAD models. Luckily, SolidWorks has a feature that enables you to input an equation to the final line. Using that equation, I can modify the variables of camber, position of maximum camber, and thickness, which are going to be the three main test variables. Initially, I wanted to do a design of experiment to identify which of the three variables are most significant in wing performance. Using the NACA four-digit airfoil classification system, the first thing I did was designate a base airfoil from which to generate the other profiles from. So that was a wing with a maximum camber of 6% of the cord, a maximum camber position of 40% of the cord length, and a maximum thickness of 12% of the cord, a 6-4-12 airfoil according to the NACA designation. So I introduced two camber variants at 12% and 18% of the wing cord, two variants of maximum camber position, and then lastly I introduced two different thickness variants. I ran all these profiles at 5 degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees and 20 degrees angle of attack because I wanted to understand how the wing performed over the range of possible use you might encounter as you adjust the ring track side or if you want to use the wing in a different application. The mission was really just to map the wing. Test speed was 44.7 meters per second, which is 100 mile an hour or 160 kilometers per hour. The measured variables were force. So I was looking at force in the Z direction and force in the X direction, lift force and drag force respectively. And once I understood the lift and drag forces, it would allow me to evaluate the efficiency. 
which is lift over drag. The profile that was best suited was a 12, 5, 12 profile. So at this point, we've pretty much done all the hard work. We've got a wing profile, the 12, 5, 1, 2 profile. It created a high lift because we've got a substantial amount of camber, but also the position of max camber along the cord of the wing and the maximum thickness of the wing seemed to be pretty good all round. Um, we didn't have too much separation. The profile of lift to drag seemed reasonable and the efficiency wasn't the highest, but again, was reasonable. As we can see though, there is some separation. There was method to my choosing a wing profile that had separation. It would allow us to investigate various measures that we can use to reduce that separation while maintaining the wing profile. So we'll get into that a little bit later and it will allow us to just learn more about the wing in general. So now we're in the 3D realm, we start to observe some of the negative parasitic flow characteristics and flow structures inherent to wings. The first thing I wanted to look at, which is pretty well known, is the concept of end plates. So end plates serve to provide a physical barrier to airflow from traveling from the high pressure surface to the low pressure surface. So to start off with, I just created an arbitrarily large end plate. There was no real numbers to it, I just put something there. And obviously that's way too big to be practical. But regardless, this new wing configuration has increased lift and reduced drag, so efficiency has gone up. So the next step from here is to reduce the size of the end plate and the result was this. So the upper and lower edges have been trimmed down but also the leading and trailing edges have been trimmed down. So somewhat counterintuitively, downforce increased but so did drag and therefore efficiency fell. That didn't immediately make sense so what I then did was look to plot wall shear stress which is basically just an indication of the speed of the airflow adjacent to the surface of the end plate. For those that want to read more, you can check out my article. But in short, the increased leading edge surface of the end plate was allowing the boundary layer to grow and perhaps become turbulent by the time it hit the leading edge of the airfoil. Going into a bit more detail to try and reduce the size of the end plates further, I felt like it would be a good step to figure out, out of the four dimensions, the upper surface, lower surface, leading surface and trailing surface, which was the most sensitive in terms of wing performance. So for this next version, I trimmed down the upper surface and you can see what's going on here. This then, as you can see from the streamlines, allowed flow to leak or migrate over from the high pressure flow field to the outside of the end plate, which then created this vortices you can see coming off the top edge. Next, I trimmed down the lower surface, as you can see, and with this change, downforce actually fell quite a lot. We'd pretty much lost about 20 newtons of downforce. So that told me that the upper and lower lengths of the end plates is a pretty sensitive characteristic. So I continued to mess around with it, reducing the leading edge, reducing the trailing edge, rounding the corners, eventually until I reached a design that I felt was pretty sensible. Finishing up, I settled on an end plate configuration that had only lost 12 newtons from the original large end plate design. And with that, we had lost about a newton of drag. Efficiency had fallen slightly, but I was happy with this design. So let's move forward. So at this point, I wanted to finish the investigation into the end plates. We could continue to go around in iterations for quite a while before we get the really optimal one. But I feel like I've got a good understanding as to what I need to look out for in an end plate. And that means we can now get into adjusting the next problem, which is flow separation. So flow separation is a phenomenon that is experienced by all airfoils. The conditions at the low pressure boundary layer on an airfoil encounter are quite interesting as conversely to the normal flow, it's moving into an adverse pressure gradient, meaning it's traveling from a low pressure to a high pressure. When this adverse pressure gradient is too large, the flow separates. What you get is towards the trailing edge of the airfoil, a region of recirculating air that not only doesn't contribute to lift, it contributes to drag in the form of pressure drag. It's usually only seen in high angles of attack and in the aerospace world it's known as stall, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. So what can we do about stall? There's a flow device known as a gurney flap, which is placed at the trailing edge of an airfoil at 90 degrees to the high pressure surface. And the concept is that this protrusion catches the airflow traveling over the high pressure surface which then increases the pressure on the upper surface of the wing which is good for us 
But not only that, it leaves a low pressure in its wake. And that then modifies the flow gradient on the low pressure surface of the wing and acts to keep the flow attached for longer. So looking at the CFD, you can see that's exactly what's happened. When plotting the pressure contour across the flow field of the aerofoil, you can see that with the gurney flap, the high pressure on the upper surface is stronger than without the gurney flap, which is going to contribute to your maximum lift. Looking closer at the area of recirculating flow trailing the gurney flap, as denoted by these vector arrows, you can actually see the flow is remaining attached to the low pressure side of the airfoil for longer. So that should contribute to increased performance in terms of lift, but I would expect it to introduce more drag. And the numbers reveal exactly that. We've gained 70 newtons just under of downforce, but we also gained about 30 newtons of drag. So to summarize, Gurney flap should perhaps only be used in circumstances where you can't change the wing profile and you're not so sensitive to drag, so maybe you've got a very high power car or it's a low speed track. So from the initial 3D simulation we did with this 12.512 airfoil, with no end plates, no gurney flap, we've now gained 100 newtons of downforce, but we've also increased drag by 25 newtons and we've lost 0.74 on our efficiency. We're just looking at this wing in free space. If we were to install it on a car, we'd obviously have to mount it. Mounting a wing can be done in two ways really. You can mount to the upper surface or the lower surface. So I'm going to evaluate both of those and see what they do to the flow, how they influence the drag, how they influence the downforce. So the first job was to prepare a CAD. And as you can see, I've generated two models, one with the high pressure mounting and one with the low pressure mounting. I took care to ensure that the actual area that the mounting occupies on the wing was the same for both mountings. And that would make sure that we could get a reliable comparison. Getting into the CFD, I've again plotted the wall shear stress to see what the flow is doing on the surface of the airfoil. But I've also used streamlines and the vortex core shading that we saw previously. The impact of the high pressure mounting wasn't too bad. We lost about 10 newtons of downforce, but we also gained 10 newtons of drag so the efficiency of the wing took quite a big hit. Generally, you can just see that the flow is getting a bit messy. You've got some flow traveling from just behind the wing mount to the center of the span, and there's some recirculation, but it hasn't affected the high pressure flow too badly. The low pressure mounting, on the other hand, carried a bit more of an impact, to the downforce at least, where we lost 30 newtons. It only gained another four newtons of drag, which meant the efficiency didn't take such a hit as the high pressure mounting, but the flow just aft of the wing mount on the low pressure side started to get really messy. Primarily, there was quite a lot of recirculation. This meant that the low pressure flow on the underside of the wing was really disrupted and explains the 30 newtons of downforce that was lost. So really there's merit in both configurations. If you're more sensitive to drag, then you might want to go for the low pressure mounting, but if you're really just trying to maximize downforce and you're not so sensitive to drag, then perhaps the high pressure mounting makes sense. It all depends on the application. So with that final understanding as to the advantages and disadvantages of the different mounting techniques, that pretty much concludes the study. As I mentioned earlier, it's a pretty small wing in span and cord, but as a reference from a start point to a finish point, I think it's given a pretty good understanding, certainly for myself. To tie it all together and make it a bit more coherent, I've knocked out this table. From this, you can see the general trend that emerged with each addition to the Aerofoil. In general, the lift increased, but there are some interesting trends to observe with drag and efficiency. So as a bit of an anecdote before we wrap up the study, I thought it would be interesting to look at the power requirements that you need to pull the wing through the air at varying speeds. At our test speed, we only required 5.7 horsepower, but at 200 miles an hour, that jumped all the way up to 47 horsepower. So you can understand why some of the real high downforce cars have some issues generating top speed. 47 horsepower that's not being used for forward propulsion but is just being used to overcome effects of drag on the wing. And this also explains why certain cars, despite having pretty much similar engine power, some have a higher top speed than others. It's all to do with the efficiency of the aerodynamic platform of the car as a whole relative to how much downforce it's producing. So I hope I managed to pass on some of my findings of this study to you guys. I'm quite a visual learner myself, so I can read some concepts and theories 10 times over and they don't quite fit together in my head, but I can see one visual demonstration of it and I'll get it instantly. This is why I like CFD quite a lot, because although it provides data and numbers, it also allows you to visualize flow 
which can then feed back into your design process. Spring's coming, summer's coming, which means the race season starts again and track days are on. I hope I'll be involved in more trackside stuff where I can bring the camera and show you some cool concepts. But yeah, just get some more visual content and demonstrations to you, the fun stuff in nice weather. Until next time.